celebration. Am I in the right church? Good morning, celebration. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I have a wonderful scripture that God put on my heart this morning, and um, I hope it will encourage you. I hope it will bring peace to your heart. How many of you know that Satan, the enemy of our soul, is trying to put chaos over us? He's trying to put stress and strife. He's trying to put fear on us, and let's see what God says to that. God says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Amen? I like what God gives. And then he gives us a command. Do not let your hearts, so let's just put our hand on our heart. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Amen. So let's just say, Father, my heart is not troubled. My heart is not afraid. And God even in another verse says um, to come to him like children, just happy, joyful, looking for the donut, looking to hang out. Amen. And uh, so let's stand up and let's just begin to just praise the Lord and thank him that we don't have to partner with uh, what the enemy is trying to do. Amen? All right, here we go.
people don't usually do this for worship, but I grew up in Texas, and this is how we worship, like the soul, you know? <laughs> and um, God, I wrote this song before God gave us this building, and I just it was just in faith that God was going to move us from being renters to owners, and he was going to take care of every problem. So rejoice with me, because not only did he let us buy it, but he's more than sustained us. Can we give him praise? And you know what that's like. When something is way bigger than you and only God can do it. Anybody got a situation like that today? Hallelujah. So here we go. Let's sing. We praise before the miracle. Amen. Here we go.
We've got some major financial things going on. All right. How about in your families? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Both hands. <laughs> yeah. How about in your health? Those are the three things the Lord talked to me about. So we have a, a pastor who has the gift of faith. He really does, and the gift of peace and wisdom. And so I ask if um, you would just lift your hands, and he's just going to begin to pray for you before we sing this third song. And remember our scripture for today. My peace I give you. Not as the world, not as the world thinks, not as the world goes through stuff. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. Amen. Great. 
and praise. You know, um, my husband and my son and I, we, we have a just a long-standing habit. Um, we just always say, I love you. Uh, you know, if, we're, if it's the last thing we say on the phone, we never hang up without, I love you. If we text, whatever we're texting, then we put hearts or I love you. I remember when Cameron lived at home before he got all big and tough and moved to LA, became <laughs> a studio musician. But he still says it, I love you, Mom, I love you. And it's our greatest need. And the greatest gift is love. And, and God, God, the source of true love is God. And every day, God is saying to us, I, I died for you, I rose again for you. I'm, I'm not only your savior, I'm your father, I'm your king, I'm your friend. And he's saying to us, if we just take the time to be with him, I love you. I want to take care of you, you know? But you know, when you say it, if it's not said back, it's a really empty space, isn't it? And can you just take just a little time this morning before we get into our announcements and everything and just close your eyes and just tell the Lord, I love you back. I love you back. Thank him for the breath in your lungs. Thank you, God. Thank you for the beat in our heart. Thank you for the food on our table. Thank you for this church. Thank you for your people. But most of all, thank you for your presence. We love you, Jesus. We know a troubled heart will become a bitter heart. A troubled heart will become a hard heart. And that's why you say, don't, don't let it be troubled. Just let things go. And don't be afraid. Because his peace and his love, he gives to us. And we receive it, God, and we, we give it back. Feel that greatest need in our life, God, the need to be loved, accepted, approved of. We bless you this morning, God, with our love. We say we love you back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That was a... That was a good word about strife. How's everybody doing today? Good. All right. Man, it's so good to be with you guys. Really been looking forward to today. We're going to continue our series entitled The Higher Level of Faith. And uh, today's going to be part three of that six part series. And uh, as always, you can go on our church YouTube channel at Celebration Church Office to uh, see any of the, the previous installments um, because the, each message is gonna build on the other. But again, it, it's entitled A Higher Level of Faith. All right, so part three, A Higher Level of Faith. My message today is entitled Right place, right time. Right place, right time. But before we before we get into this, um, you know, yesterday was the 20 year anniversary, right, yep. of 9/11. Yep. The 20 year anniversary, and um, it doesn't seem like it's been 20 years, does it? No. It it just seems like that was that happened just recently I remember and I'm sure you probably remember that day you remember where you were what was happening in your life at that particular time I, I totally remember that day and over the years I've heard so many amazing stories that happened on that day and the days afterwards miraculous things, um, how God moved in people's lives and protected people and did, there's so many stories. I wanna share one of those stories with you that happened on that day. There was a man by the name of, of Stanley, I can't pronounce his last name, it's really difficult, 
but he was the assistant vice president for Fuji Bank, and he was trapped on the 81st floor of tower number two after the United Airlines plane hit, hit tower number two. So he's on the 81st floor, and he was trapped. He was, he was up to his neck in debris. And, the, and one of the wings of the airplane was burning right nearby him. So Stanley was a Christian. And in desperation, he began to pray. And he asked the Lord to please send someone to help him. And while he was praying, he saw the beam of a flashlight. And he heard someone on the other side of all the debris that he was trapped in. And so he started yelling to try to get the attention of whoever was on the other side. And the other person could hear him, but couldn't get to him. They were able to talk to each other, but they couldn't, they, the other man couldn't reach him. So Stanley asked this man, are you a Christian? Do you know Jesus? And the man said, yes. And so Stanley says, can we pray together? Can we pray together? So they joined in prayer while they were still separated from all this debris. And as they prayed, Stanley began, he, he got this impression in his spirit to start kicking. He starts kicking the, the wall and, and pretty soon a small hole starts to, to, to open up and it gets bigger and bigger. And the man on the other side, his name is Brian Clark. He was able to reach his hand through that hole and he was able to pull Stanley through the debris to the other side. And then they began the long descent from the 81st floor. And they escaped the building minutes before it collapsed. An amazing story of faith. An amazing story of the reliance on God. They prayed and God answered. God responded. God showed them what to do. The God that we pray to, the God that you pray to is faithful. Amen. Is faithful to respond to you. It's been 20 years. But the calamities in our nation continue. That was the first. But it continues. We are in yet another twenty years ago after nine eleven Pastor Luan and I for the Sundays, many Sundays after directed our church to a, to a passage in the Old Testament in the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I want to read you this. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, starting at verse 13. God says this, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or when I command locusts to devour the land, 
or when I send a plague among my people. If, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear. I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. How many calamities before we will do what God says? How many more? How many more variants? We're only on Delta. There is Echo, Foxtrot, we could go through the alphabet. How many more <coughs> calamities? How many more people have to die before we will do what God says to do? If you knew that it would save people's lives, in this community, in your family, in your workplace, if you knew it would save people's lives if you only came on either Tuesday morning Amen. or Friday That's evening right. at 7 That's and right. prayed, That's right. would you do it? That's right. How many more calamities? It's not complicated. God said this. God said this to Solomon when he dedicated the temple. It's been thousands of years. It's not complicated. What happens on Tuesday is not going to fix it. The only thing that's going to fix it is if you will pray. That's the truth. Amen. That's the only thing. Because God is faithful. He promises. He says, if you'll do that, I will do, I will do this. He says, I, not only will I forgive you, but I will heal not just one person, he says, the land. That's right. That's right. That's right. How many more calamities? Victory in life comes from faith in God. Amen. It doesn't come any other way. Victory in life comes from faith in God. Faith in God comes from love for God. Yeah. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 and 4, it says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. Amen. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong. Amen. Upright and just is he. 
He's, a, he's the faithful God who does no wrong. Amen. Now, if you've known God at all for any length of time, you know that he's faithful. Probably the, 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 my favorite example is, is how God gave Israel a promise. He promised to give them a land. And there was an incredible amount of time, an incredible amount of things that had to happen in order for that promise to be fulfilled, but that promise was fulfilled. And this is something that I want to talk to you guys about today, because I want to look at this promise. Because again, this series is entitled A Higher Level of Faith. And so in order for our faith to increase, we have to understand how God works. Amen? Does that make sense? Amen. Do you want to know how he works? Yes. Yeah. You, you need to understand this because when you don't understand how God works, you make decisions that are bad. You make decisions that hurt yourself because you didn't understand how God works. So this is what we want to look at today on a higher level of faith. So first, let's look at the promise. So in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, we're introduced to a man by the name of Abram, whose name would later be changed to Abraham. Anybody heard of Abraham? Everybody yes. heard that name? Yes. His original name was Abram, okay? So God comes to Abram during a time when there was hardly anyone of, at all of faith. God comes to Abram and he tells Abram, take your wife and your nephew, whose name was Lot, that's an interesting name, take your nephew and leave your country, leave your family, leave your where you live, go to another country that I will show you. He doesn't tell him where. So, so Abram and his wife and his nephew and all their possessions, and they, they take off on this journey not knowing where they're going to go. And so, guess where the land was that God, was, God told Abram to go to? It was, a, it was a land called Canaan, which was also, would be referred to later as the promised land. He sends him to this land. He, he gets there. He gets to a place that's called Hebron, which is about 22 miles away from what's now Jerusalem. And when he gets to this land, finally, that he didn't know any, where he was going, and he just, just camps out there, and God says, okay, you're here. And he's kind of, okay, great, you know. God speaks to him again. This time in Genesis chapter 13, starting at verse 14, it says, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north and south, to the east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. He says, look around. Everything that you see, I'm gonna give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth. So that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. What a, what a promise. Mm -hmm. Look as far as you can see. Go, go check it out. Go walk as long as you want in any direction. It's all yours. And not only that, I'm going to multiply your offspring. In other words, I'm going to multiply the amount of people who believe in me and trust in me just like you do. 
Do you know that you are part of that offspring? That's why God said, if, if dust could be counted, you're part of the dust. <laughs> we are all part of, of the promise that God made to Abram thousands of years ago. So there's two things that I want us to look at in, in terms of in terms of understanding how God works based on this promise that he gives to to Abram. And the first one is this. God's promises are always, always connected to his timing, always connected to his timing. The more you know God, the more you love God and the more you understand how God works. Remember, victory in life comes from faith in God. Faith in God comes from a love for God. The more you know God, the more you love him, the more you understand how he works. This is how, how victory happens. Now think about this promise that, that God gives to, to Abram. Isn't it interesting that God would give him this promise? He would promise him the land that he was already settled in. He was already there. He was already camped out there. But if you notice, the promise itself is for the future. He says, I will give you. I will give it to you and your offspring. All that's future. Yeah. That's not now. Right. Even though he's there. Do you see that? Yes. It's because with God, it's always about his timing. Always. Always about his timing. Turn to the person next to you and tell him, it's always about God's timing. Always. No exception. It's always about God's timing. That's how he works. God's basically saying, I'm giving this to you, but not yet. Yeah. Don't you love the not yet? I love the not yet. Yeah, God's like, I'm giving it to you, but not yet. Have you ever had a not yet promise? Those are fun. The day I met Luann, she literally knocked on my door. I opened the door and music started. <laughs> Same music, still playing. <laughs> literally. And, and that day, the Lord told me, I mean, I was a brand new Christian, like about a month. Been, been, I was clean and sober for a month. It, and it wasn't, a, it wasn't a hallucination or anything. God spoke to me and said, she's going to be your wife. I was so excited. But it was a not yet. <laughs> and that was way before I had any understanding of the not yet. But that was my introduction to the not yet. It would be two years. The not yet for, for us was two years. But I shouldn't complain because we, let's look at Abram's not yet. <laughs> So let's go to Genesis 15. We were at Genesis chapter 13, but let's go to Genesis 15, verse 12, starting at verse 12. It says, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, 
know for certain that for 400 years, I'm not complaining, God. <laughs> For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Four generations, 400 years, not yet. I'm giving this to you, but not yet. He even says it in verse 16. Not yet. But this time, God explains the not yet. He explains his timing of when the promise would be fulfilled. Isn't it interesting? He says, after 400 years, he says, first of all, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. Egypt, 400 years. After 400 years, and he says they'll be enslaved and mistreated. We all know the story, we've all seen the Disney movie, right? <laughs> Verse 14, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. Passover. Verse 16, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. The promised land. Yeah. Right where you're standing. 400 years from now. Um, over a million strong, your descendants will come right back here. But then he says, he explains the timing. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. The Amorites were one of the peoples that lived in Canaan. It's amazing to think that God would even connect their sin with the timing of his people. That Israel, Israel would end up defeating the Amorites later on to take that land. So it's so important that you understand God's timing. One of the mistakes that we make is to decide to do something and it may even be the right thing. But we decide to do something but it's the wrong time. Right. Have you ever made a decision and done something only to realize the timing was wrong? There's, a, there's an old story that I wanted to read to you. It's called The Fern and the Bamboo. It says, one day I wanted to quit. I wanted to quit my job. I wanted to run from my relationship and my spiritual journey. I just wanted to quit life, stop this world and let me off. I went to the woods to have one last good talk with God. God, I said, can you give me one good reason not to quit? His answer surprised me. Look around, he said, do you see the fern seeds and the bamboo seeds and the plants? Yes. 
God says, when I planted the fern and the bamboo seeds, I took very good care of them. I gave them light. I gave them water. The fern quickly grew from the earth. Its brilliant green covered the floor, yet nothing came from the bamboo seed. But I did not quit on the bamboo. In the second year, the fern grew more vibrant and plentiful. Again, nothing from the bamboo seed. But I did not quit on the bamboo. He said, in the third year, there was still nothing from the bamboo, but I would not quit. In the fourth year, again, nothing from the bamboo seed, but I would not quit. He said, then in the fifth year, a tiny sprout emerged. Compared to the fern, it was seemingly small and insignificant. But just six months later, the bamboo rose to over a hundred feet tall. It had spent five unseen years growing roots. Amen. That's right. Those roots made it strong and gave it what it needed to survive. I would not give any of my creations a challenge it could not handle. He said to me, did you know, my child, that all this time you have been struggling, you have actually been growing roots. Amen. I would not quit on the bamboo. I will never quit on you. Don't compare <clears throat> yourself to others. He said the bamboo had a different purpose than the fern, yet they both make the forest beautiful. Your time will come, God said to me. You will rise high. How high should I rise, I asked. How high will the bamboo rise, he asked in return. As high as it can? God said, yes. Give me glory by rising as high as you can. Your struggle is for a purpose. God's timing is so incredibly important. God is faithful. With God, there is a time for everything. In Ecclesiastes, uh, even even talks about that. He says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. God's timing is important because with God, there is a time for everything. Let me ask you a question. In your life, is it time for something to be birthed? Or is it a time for something to die? Is it a time to plant? Or is it a time to uproot something? Is it a time to tear something down? Or is it a time to build something? Is it a time to weep? Or is it a time to laugh? Is it a time to be silent? Or is it a time to speak? God's timing 
we need to know and understand God's timing in our lives. Sometimes it's not yet, but sometimes it's now. It's now. Remember, for the past two weeks, we've looked at Joshua chapter 1, verse, starting verse, uh, verse 2. It says, Moses, my servant is dead. God's speaking to Joshua. He says, now then. Let me hear you say now. Now. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. God says to Joshua, now. In other words, that's a today word. Now is a today word. God spoke a today word to Joshua. Let me ask you, has God spoken a today word to you? Yes. Maybe, maybe God is saying some things and maybe God has already <coughs> spoken to you this morning where God is saying something to you. Now is the time. Now is the time to move. Now is the time to act. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 1, it says, As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, God says this, In the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, Amen. and now is the day of salvation. Amen. God's favor is available to you now. better take advantage of it. Because it's a now word. It's not a, it's not a, well, you know, whenever you're ready. It's a now. Salvation is available to you now. Amen. It's not, well, you know, I'm not quite ready yet, but, you know, once I get a few things lined up, you know, <laughs> just change, get, you know, whatever. It's a now word. When God says now, he means now. Yeah. One of the biggest mistakes we can make is to say, when God says now, we say not yet. Yeah. And when God says not yet, we say now. Right? <laughs> right? Come on now. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Because we all do it. God says now, we're like, no, well, not yet. <laughs> we need to understand God's timing and let me tell you going back to how we started today now is the time to pray amen for our nation. Amen. Don't say not yet to God when he's saying now. It only hurts us. It only hurts you when we tell him not yet when he says now. So God's timing is important. The second thing I wanted to share with you is that God's promises are often progressive in nature. So we need to understand God's timing. There's always a time with God. Could be not yet, could be now. But God's promises are also progressive in nature. They, they build on, there, there's a building process. There's things that have to happen in order, and you know, as, it, as the promise uh, comes to fruition. So let's go to, let's go back to Joshua chapter one. And again, starting verse one, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, 
son of Nun, Moses aid, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the West. The key phrase I want you to see is about to give. In verse two, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them. Even though, though the land had been promised, we already saw the promise from 400 years before. They still had to claim the land. They still had to overcome. Yes. First of all, they had to overcome and, and claim it by crossing the Jordan River. That, that river was a physical, it was a mental, it was a spiritual barrier between them and the promise. But even after they crossed over, it wasn't like, okay, the promise is ours, here we are. They still had to, they still had to do the work to claim it. They had to progressively, systematically, um, carefully take over the possession that God had given them. And I want you to see this thing um, from Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 10, going back again. It says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities, that you did not build. Houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did uh, that you did not provide. Wells that you did not dig. Vineyards, olive groves that you did not plant. Then, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. God brought them out of slavery into a land where everything had already been set up for them. God tells the people, not only am I going to give you this new land, but I'm going to do it in a way that's going to blow your mind. That's right. It's going to be more amazing than you could ever imagine yep. how I'm going to do this and what this is actually going to be. Yes. You're just going to move into cities that are already built, houses that are already furnished. It's an all expenses paid trip, baby. <laughs> That's my God. All expenses. It's the ultimate hookup. Are you starting to get a picture in your mind of how God thinks and how God operates? I dare you to find anyone in your life that can do that for you. That's right. I dare you. But my God can. Yes, he can. Hallelujah. And my God will because he's faithful. So now let's look. Joshua and the people cross the Jordan River miraculously. This is in Joshua chapter 5, starting in verse 10. It says, On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. They cross over and, and, were, and were given a date stamp on the 14th day of the month. 
they're camped out in the promised land. It's the beginning and they celebrate. Verse 11, the day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. They had been, God had been taking care of them feeding, God was feeding them. But once they moved into the new land with all the abundance, yeah. God says, all right, you're on your own. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. So they crossed the river they set up camp, and the first thing they do is honor God. Amen. They honor him with a party. <laughs> they celebrate because God has been faithful. Think about it. They were experiencing the promise of God that had been given 400 years before. They were there. Yeah. They were eating and enjoying and looking at and crying together and hugging each other and excited because God had promised that to them four generations before. Now, was all the land theirs at that point? No. They still had work to do. But you know what? Where they were standing was theirs. Amen. It was theirs. And they got to enjoy the blessing that came with that. It's interesting, too, that God picked a particular time. He picked harvest time for them to make that move. It was harvest time. Everything was abundant. Think, it says that they ate the produce of the land. We're talking over a million people. You think there was, you know, enough stuff there to eat? It was harvest time. Right away, God set it up for them to taste and see that the Lord is good. God's promises are progressive. And they were on their way to receiving all that God had promised. God is faithful. I want to close with a uh, with a story that I heard about, again, about the faithfulness of God. It's really amazing. It's a lady by the name of Tracy um, from uh, the state of Washington. And this is back in 2002. And a uh, true story. This is her writing. Back in 2002, she was uh, 34 years old and she had been a diabetic for 21 years. And she says, on Monday, August 19th of 2002, I was running late for work. I had missed my carpool, which meant I had to drive myself into work. And I worked from 4 p.m. to midnight. She says, I live in Linwood, Washington, and I work in downtown Seattle. I had been very busy that day and hadn't eaten enough. This causes my blood sugar to drop too low. For the 21 years I've had diabetes, I always had a warning sign before one of these episodes was coming on. I always get a weak and shaky feeling in my legs. 
And when this happens, I have about 10 minutes to get some sugar in me before I get confused and disoriented. Never before has this not happened until that day. I remember merging on the freeway in Linwood. I don't remember anything else after that. When I woke up, I was in an ambulance for about 30 miles. I had driven in a diabetic coma and was unconscious. 30 miles on the freeway. I didn't have a scratch on me. My car had only a few scratches of paint missing. More importantly, I hadn't hurt anyone else. Traffic is very busy that time of the day. The miracle of this event is this. All my life, especially when I'm feeling down, I ask the Lord for a sign to prove he is still with me. And he probably does, but I'm always blind to see it. But how more obvious could he be? He drove my car for me while I was hot cold. He saved many lives in their cars. He pulled the car over for me and stopped it safely away from all that traffic. That day was a blessing for me. God is with us every second of the day, even when our thoughts are a million miles away. Do not ever doubt that he is with you. Once you've given your life and your heart over to him, he never leaves. He is faithful, loving, kind, and protecting to those who honor him. I also think he has a sense of humor. Okay, God, I finally get it. I'm never alone. You were always there, and you've never left me. Thanks to the Lord. Tracy Hart. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. When will we believe? God is faithful. Victory in life comes from faith in God. Faith in God comes from loving God. Don't misunderstand God's timing. And don't misunderstand that he works in a progressive way. Because he is faithful. I want you to bow your heads right now. What is God telling you to do? Is there a today word from God for you? What is God saying to you? That's a now word. And will you say yes? And what promise is God giving you to hold on to? Is there a not yet word from God for you? Is there a not yet promise that you just have to hold on to? You have to believe that you have to wait, you have to be still and wait. But you wait in faith, believing, trusting that his word is gonna happen, his promise is gonna happen for you. Do you have one of those? Is there something God has spoken to you in that way? This is so important today. I believe God is speaking both things to so many of us here today. But if 
is all predicated on God's faithfulness. He is the faithful God who does no wrong. He is the faithful one that loves you, that cares for you, that has amazing things planned for you. His plans for you are good. So I just want to give you guys just a moment, just between you and the Lord, with every head bow. This is a time for our hearts to connect with God, to respond to whatever it is that God is saying to you. If it's a if if it's a now word, then in faith, I encourage you to say yes to Him. If it's a promise, I encourage you. Make up your mind now that you will hold on to that promise. No matter how long it takes, it might take days, it might take months, it might take years. If God has spoken something to you, there's something that you are, are you're ready to say yes to him. I want you to lift your hand right now.
to continue to give faithfully to Celebration Church. There's so many different ways that you can do that. Of course, you can mail mail, uh, mail it in or drop by our location, which is 990 Meadowgate Road in Meta Vista, uh, California, 95722. You can give online a couple of different ways. You, know, you can always use PayPal. And use the PayPal address of one celebration at sbcglobal.net 
or you can go to our our website our church website which is www.ccfellowship.org go to the home page go up to the about us uh, tab pull that down and go to the to give now and then there's a donate button that'll take you to our online giving page and uh, text giving is available as well that's our it's probably the fastest way to give to our church and that is you text the word give text the word give to area code 530-288-4500 and you can uh, give your tithe and offering uh, to, to celebration that way as well. And always, if you're watching on our YouTube channel at Celebration Church Office, subscribe and click like. We are so glad you decided to join us today. We hope you were blessed and encouraged. If you gave your life to Christ or want to reach out to us in any way, Email us at celebrationchurch13 at gmail.com. To purchase Lou Ann Lee worship CDs and songbooks, click the links below. God bless you.